leadership on the Health Committee, on which all of us serve. One of the newer members of the Health Committee brings a lot of expertise, Senator Cassidy from Louisiana. He wasn't there, uh, at least not in the Senate, on the night that passed, but he's written forcefully uh, about the fact that while premiums were going up, something else was going down, and that were family incomes, because of the 30-hour work week. Senator Cassidy, you, you had an article in Forbes magazine in 2014 that pointed out the impact of, of the 30-hour work week in Obamacare and how that was hurting working families. Senator Alexander, one of the ironies of this is that it was promoted as a way to help lower-income families make ends meet better. But if you require employers to provide insurance to low-wage workers, what the predictable... Will the senator use his microphone? What the predictable response of an employer who has thin margins is to actually convert those full-time workers to part-time workers. Now, this doesn't happen for the CEO or for the CEO's lieutenants. It doesn't happen for middle management. The folks it happens most for are those lower-paid workers. I once went grocery shopping in Baton Rouge, and a woman rung me up. The next day, my wife sent me to another store to get something else at another store. The same woman was ringing me up. And I said, well, I just saw you at this door, but now I see you at this door. She goes, my first, I'm paraphrasing, my first employer reduced my hours, so now I've had to take a second job to make ends meet. Now, that's the personal story. But what the labor statistics show is that since the recession has technically ended, the hours worked per week have recovered for higher income workers, but it is for the lower income worker they've continued to suffer. The most vulnerable, the most vulnerable has been the most affected in terms of hours worked. But it's not just the most vulnerable affected by this, it's the middle class. The New York Times, the New York Times, wrote an article this past or two weeks ago uh, in which they pointed out that the, the, the headline says it all. Many say high deductibles make their health law insurance all but useless. And they quote a gentleman, David Raines from New Jersey, I think that is he, um, uh, 60 years old. He says the deductible $3,000 a year makes it impossible to actually go to the doctor. We have insurance but can't afford to use it. And so it's the middle income worker who has also had a policy which previously would allow him or her to go to the doctor. Now they can't because the way that Obamacare uh, is so structured is that it is too expensive, that out-of-pocket first exposure. What you're saying is that, if I hear you right, that in the worst of circumstances, that the effect of Obamacare on some of the people you're talking with means they're working fewer hours, so they have less money, their insurance premium is higher, and so is their deductible. That's the effect. And in terms of insurance premiums, you can't make this up. This is a fellow from Houma, Louisiana. First name's Mark. We scratched out his last name. And this is his letter from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana to inform him uh, that his policy, which previously had been $207 per month, was going up in 2016 to $961 per month. His policy has been roughly $2,400 a year. It's going up to $11,500 a year, and, they, and this because of the affordable care the Unaffordable Care Act. The, the essential problem with, with Obamacare for people who buy individual insurance seems to me to be, Senator Isaacson, that, that Washington tells you what insurance to buy. I think of a woman named Emily in Middle Tennessee who wrote me, who has lupus, who had a policy that she could afford. It had modest benefits, and it didn't cost very much, but it fit her needs. But Obamacare canceled that policy, and when she went online to find another policy, her costs went up uh, from, from $100 to $400 a month. I guess you've heard stories like that as well in Georgia. All the time, because what happened with Obamacare is the following. People that had insurance they could afford and had bought coverage they needed were forced to buy coverage they didn't need because of the mandates in Obamacare in terms of what had to be included. So it forced more coverage that you didn't need, which raised the premium that you paid. So you end up paying from less and getting less, and it was the mandates of Obamacare that did it. Senator Cassidy, of course, has a unique perspective on this as a practicing physician. I think he still practices some as much as he can within the Senate 
rules, but he sees patients regularly. How would, what was the effect of this new health care law five and a half years ago on the ability of patients to choose their own physicians? Now, the, the way that the market has responded in order to make insurance affordable despite the mandates is our so-called narrow networks. And so someone signs up for the most affordable policy that they can get. Turns out their doctor, who, whom they previously saw, is not on this plan. And, uh, and, and so the narrow network is going to be just a small set of doctors. The specialist may be in another town. One hospital, not all hospitals. And patients were unfamiliar with this. They did not expect it. But that was their only affordable option. Uh, the mandates have driven up the cost so much. By the way, uh, going back to the, the letter you got about the mandated benefits, in my recent campaign, I had a woman walk up to me, and she goes, my name is Tina, and I'm angry. I've had a hysterectomy. I'm 56 years old, and I have no children. My husband and I are paying $500 more for a month for insurance, which we cannot afford, and I'm paying for pediatric dentistry, and I'm paying for obstetrical services. No hysterectomy, 56 years old, and no children. Or as another woman told me who was 58 and her husband 57, the only reason I would need obstetrical services, which I'm forced to buy, is if my name is Sarah and my husband is Abraham. But that's not the case. <laughs> now, I would say Senator Isaacson, before he came to the Senate, was a small businessman in, in Georgia. Uh, and, and probably the, la the, the largest employer in our country are, is the hospitality industry, restaurants, hotels, that sort of thing, employing many young people, many minority people. I met with a number of restaurant owners who told me after the Obamacare passed that because of the costs of that insurance to the company, that their goal would be in a restaurant to reduce the number of employees from 90 to 70. So Obamacare cost jobs. Did you hear that kind of experience in Georgia is not well. only did it cost jobs but it forced many people who had full-time jobs into part-time jobs because of the mandates small business got hurt and their employees got hurt the mandates of Obamacare for coverage the mandates for taxation the mandates for deductibles all contributed to the increasing cost of Obamacare and made health care more out of the reach rather than more accessible uh, in Memphis is proud of the fact that it is a center for medical device innovation some of the leading medical device companies um, in, the, in, in the world are located in Tennessee, Memphis, Tennessee. And, and the, 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 the Obamacare bill, part of its trillion dollars in new taxes included a medical device tax, which put an especially onerous tax on the gross income of medical devices, causing the president of Costa Rica to put up signs saying, welcome to Costa Rica to medical device companies. Uh, I wonder if in Louisiana or Georgia you had any experience with the impact of the medical device tax on your constituents. Yeah, there's a fellow who started a medical device uh, startup in New Orleans. And he was saying that he has been offered to move his business to Panama because a major portion of his market is overseas. And so the medical device tax is, of course, a tax upon the gross of a business. If he moves overseas to Panama, taking those jobs with him, and he can continue to sell internationally, not pay tax on that, but only sell tax on that which he brings back to the United States, well, then he's obviously reducing his tax burden. Those are high-paying, white-collar jobs in New Orleans, a city recovering from Katrina, and if the power to tax is the power to destroy, this tax has the power to destroy the ability of this gentleman to continue to expand in New Orleans. One of the, Senator Isaacson, I, I recall one of the most vigorous debates we had five and a half years ago was, first the president promised that we won't touch Medicare. Next thing you know, they took $700 million out of Medicare to spend on new programs. At a time when the Medicare trustees, whose job it is to tell us things like this, said, the program was going to go broke unless we did something about it. We, we were saying, if you're going to take money away from grandma's Medicare, you better spend it on grandma. But they didn't. And so they've impacted Medicare recipients in Georgia and Tennessee and Louisiana. Well, the president basically robbed Peter to pay Peter. 
He robbed the beneficiary of Medicare benefits and then took the money and spent it on somebody else. So the person who had the benefit didn't have the benefit any longer. The problem with this entire deal is it was a charade. Promises were made. If you like your policy, you can keep it. Turned out to be wrong. Premiums are going to go down. Turned out to be wrong. If you couldn't get insurance, you will be able to get insurance. Well, that ended up being true to a part, but it became something known as a bronze policy. You know what a bronze policy was? It was a policy that gave you coverage, but the deductible was so big you couldn't get to the coverage. So every time there was a promise, there was a broken promise, an increased cost, and less accessibility to coverage. Mr. President, how much time remains in our colloquy? Senators have six minutes remaining. Six minutes remaining. I'd like to ask, uh, uh, we've heard a lot in the news lately about co-ops. This was an invention of Obamacare that was designed to provide health care to uh, to, to many Americans. Uh, I know that in South Carolina, for example, closures of these co-ops for 67,000 South Carolinians, Tennessee, 27,000 Tennesseans, suddenly to have to find new coverage. I wonder if either in Louisiana or Georgia you've had any experience with the new co-ops and the Obamacare plan. Yeah, Louisiana's, um, Louisiana's co-op failed. It attempted to lower costs with the skinny network but ultimately it still could not compete. Um, if I may kind of point out, we've talked about how the low wage worker has had her opportunities diminished by this law. We've discussed how the middle class family oftentimes having insurance they were told they could keep lost it and now they have deductibles of $3,000 which they will say makes, it, makes the insurance something they cannot afford. And now we're speaking about the U.S. taxpayer. The U.S. taxpayer who has put billions towards these co-ops, there is some evidence the administration continued to put money into them even when they knew that they were going to fail, and yet now they are failing, over half, and supposedly more slated to do so. So it isn't just the low-wage worker, the middle-class family, it is all of us taxpayers who have taken a hit for promises made, but promises broken. During our debate five and a half years ago and at the health care summit uh, at the Blair House, sometimes our Democratic friends would say, well, when are you Republicans going to come up with a big comprehensive plan? And my answer to them was, if you're waiting for Senator McConnell to roll a wheelbarrow onto the Senate floor with a 2,700-page McConnell care bill, you're going to be waiting till you know, the sky turns purple, because we don't believe in that. We don't think we're wise enough in Washington, D.C to write a comprehensive plan for everything about the American health care for all of the people in this country. Instead, what we proposed to do, and we proposed it over and over and over again, was to move step by step in a different direction toward more choices, more freedom, and lower costs. In fact, I counted it up, Mr. President, 173 times in the congressional record in the year 2009, we Republicans laid out our plans for step by step toward Toward, uh, toward those costs. Steps like the step that Senator Scott from South Carolina did persuade in a bipartisan way just this year to free small business, to, to free states with the ability to set the rates for the kind of insurance small businesses could buy and avoided an 18% increase in premiums. Those are the kind of steps that we would take in a different direction to give the American people those costs. So our, th 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 those options. So our, our time has expired for the colloquy. I want to thank the senator from Georgia, Senator Isaacson, the senator from Louisiana, Senator Cassidy. We Republicans said five and a half years ago that premiums would go up, taxes would go up, jobs would be lost, state budgets would be burdened by Medicaid. All that turned out to be true, unfortunately. The president said, you, if you like your plan, you can keep it. That turned out to be untrue, unfortunately. We're prepared to go in a different direction, more choices, more freedom, lower costs. But first this week, we're going to repeal Obamacare, which has caused such problems for the American people, and then we'll head in a different direction. I thank the president, and I yield the floor.